The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Same chapter, this important reminder to go along with verse 9. Commit your works or your plans to the Lord, and your plans will be established. Now keep those thoughts in mind and go with me to the 21st chapter of Proverbs. Proverbs 21, please. Verse 5. The plans of the diligent lead surely to an advantage, but everyone who is hasty comes surely to poverty. Brethren, these Proverbs alone show us that God does not want us to go through this life aimlessly, but the Lord encourages us to make plans, set goals, knowing that this will be much more productive, especially those spiritual goals that we may set. Yes, even a blind squirrel finds a nut sometimes. But we all know that if you aim at nothing, you get nothing that's productive. At least it won't be the desired goal that you're seeking. As a rule, as a rule, you can't hit a target you don't have. You can't hit a target you don't have. And so let's set goals. Let's plan for the future. This is a lesson I'd hope to give in January. It didn't work out, but it's still toward the beginning of the year. And so as we're making goals for this or that, what about those spiritual goals? What about goals concerning Bible study and prayer? What about goals concerning fellowship with our brethren? What about planning for the eternal future with smaller goals in between to help us get to that eternal goal, making our lives much more productive spiritually in the process? As James would say, and as Proverbs also reminds us, if the Lord wills, make your plans, set your goals. We want to accomplish this or that, especially for the Lord. If the Lord wills, we will do this or we will do that. Always commit your plans to the Lord. Always submit the, uh, the goals that you set unto the Lord. If it's not his will, we don't want to do it anyway. If the Lord wills, we will do this or we will do that. The Apostle Paul had numerous spiritual goals, both long-range and short-range. Both are necessary, the short-range to help us accomplish those long-range goals. A good sampling of the Apostle Paul's spiritual goals are in Philippians chapter 3. Look with me there, Philippians chapter 3. <clears throat> We'll begin there at verse 8, please. <clears throat> Philippians 3, verse 8. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, here we go, in order that, I may gain Christ. Now, the goals he talks about here, he was both living them out as well as stating here future goals, that I may gain Christ. Verse 9, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. That is a great gospel summary statement right there, verse 9. Verse 10, that I may know him, that I may know Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection, so future goal, 
that and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, in verse 11, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Verse 13, brethren, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And in pressing on toward that goal, Paul set many smaller goals in between, especially Romans 15, that he preached the gospel in cities where it had not yet been preached. Paul set those goals, he accomplished those goals, and Paul went to glory. What about Jesus? Did our Lord and Savior set goals and accomplish those goals? Absolutely. You remember his, his summary statement, uh, mission summary statement in Luke 19.10, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. And in doing that, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 20, I did not come to be served. I came to serve and give my life a ransom for many. That is, by the way, definitely one of our, what should be one of our goals, to not be served, but to serve and give our life a ransom for many in this season of opportunity that we have. Jesus set his goals, he accomplished all his goals, and Jesus has now gone to glory. So what are the benefits of spiritual goal setting? Well, the benefits are myriad. Just consider a few of them with me. First and foremost, setting spiritual goals helps us to make wise use of our time during our season of opportunity. This is following up our last lesson. This is Paul's teaching in Ephesians 5.16. Redeem the time. Make the most of your time. And the word time there is not chronos as in chronological time, but has reference to a season of opportunity. This life is our season of opportunity, and it will go by very quickly. The same word is used in Galatians 6 and verse 9. Uh, in due season, when that opportunity is there from God, our Savior will reap if we faint not. In Galatians 6 and verse 10, as we have opportunity, same word. Let us do good to all men, especially those of the, the household of faith. Well, this is our season of opportunity to serve the Lord and bring him glory. Brethren, many demands are placed upon our time. It seems everybody wants a little bit of our time, a little bit of our attention, a little bit of our money. It is simply impossible, impossible to comply with all the requests of so many people. And so, as disciples of Jesus Christ, as servants of a higher calling, heaven's calling, we must learn to prioritize. We absolutely must prioritize. We must not ever be in a situation where God is getting the leftovers because he does not accept the leftovers anyway. We, we must learn to prioritize. Now, since Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, that tells us that Christ and his glory and the kingdom of Jesus Christ is not to be one of those things competing for our time and attention. Christ is our life, Colossians 3, 4, and everything else centers around the glory of Jesus Christ and the furtherance of his kingdom. And so whatever decisions are made, it's made with that point of reference. Christ's glory and the furtherance of his kingdom comes first in family, in our job, our relationship to government, friends we choose, recreation. Christ and his kingdom always comes first. Setting spiritual goals, long and short goals, will help us narrow down what we truly can and can't do. It will help us to select and in many cases eliminate from our lives, things that we simply can't do and keep a clean conscience in the process. And so setting spiritual goals, prayer, Bible study, fellowship, visitation, hospitality, what have you, 
will truly help us redeem the time for the days are evil. Secondly, setting spiritual goals help motivate us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. For the joy set before him. Who does the Hebrew writer say that about? Yeah, Jesus. For the joy set before him. That was his long-range goal. Many short-range goals in between. Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame. He had a, he had a long-range eternal goal, the joy set before him. He endured that cross. He despised the shame. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Those who come to him must believe that he is. Not just believe in him, but believe him. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews 11 is not just a chapter on faith. It is equally a chapter on the reward of that faith. Especially for these persecuted saints that he's talking about here. And so we have Abel's reward of faith to please God and be accepted as righteous on the basis of faith. Enoch was taken up to be with God. Noah became an heir of righteousness by faith. Abraham received the city he longed for, whose architect and builder is God. Moses gave up the passing pleasures of sin, and boy, are they passing. For he was looking to the reward. Goals motivate. They make us wise, much more productive in our use of time. They motivate. And third, goal setting provides clear direction. Clear direction. A life without goals is like a ship without a rudder. It's like a leaf floating aimlessly down the river with no real direction and no control over where it goes. You think about Nehemiah, whom we studied not too long ago. Nehemiah, by the grace of God, and as a prayer warrior, praying for the opportunity to be used by God, set a goal of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, walls that had been torn down by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians 140 years earlier. Though he was hundreds of miles away, probably never set foot in Jerusalem in his life, cupbearer to the most powerful king in the ancient world at that time, he set a goal of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And by the grace and power of God, once that project began, it was finished in how many days? 52 days. God is able. We must believe that because that's what he teaches us. He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that we ask or think. Ephesians chapter 3. Set those spiritual goals in harmony with the word of God. Pray. Put them before the Lord. Commit those plans to the Lord. God is able to make you the son, the daughter he always intended you to be. Brethren, let's stop going with the flow. Take control of our lives. Stop settling for status quo or spiritual mediocrity. With God's word and prayer as our guide, submitting those plans to the Lord always. Set your own spiritual goals of Bible study and prayer, fellowship, growth. Let's forge our own path. Or God forge that path through us. And don't let anyone or anything stop you. God is able. God is able. Time remaining, I want to turn our attention now to one particular psalm, Psalm 101. Look at Psalm 101 with me, please. 
one of the Psalms of David. <clears throat> In this Psalm, perhaps more than any other, we see some of David's very noble goals revealed. And I want you to notice as we read through this psalm, just the number of times, brethren, that David says, I will do this, or I shall do this, or I will not do this. It, it, it's definitely a reminder uh, of Joshua's type of language. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Look with me at verse one here. I will sing of loving kindness and justice to thee, O Lord. I will sing praises. Verse two, I will give heed to the blameless way. When wilt thou come to me? I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip on me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will know no evil. Verse 5. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. No one who has a haughty look and an arrogant heart will I endure. My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a blameless way is the one who will minister to me. He who practices deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who speaks falsehood shall not maintain his position before me. Every morning I will destroy the wicked of the land so as to cut off from the city of the Lord those who do iniquity. Brethren, can we see that Psalm 101 is a psalm of goals and resolutions, uh, re uh, re resolutions made by David? And it may have been given at the beginning of his reign as a clear statement of faith as to how he was going to live his life and how he was going to conduct himself as the anointed king of Israel. Now, David failed at times. He failed at these resolutions. But as a rule, as a rule, this is the way David lived his life, both individually and as a king. Let's look at some of these personal resolutions first of David in verses one through four. Verses one through four. Verse one, I will sing of the loving kindness and justice to thee, O Lord. I will sing praises. So the first and foremost in David's heart is this resolution, this goal. He begins with a firm resolve to glorify God. And he will not only speak of God's goodness, but David says, I will extol your greatness in song. I will sing your praises, O Lord. That's his first resolution. Second, verse 2. David's resolve here to walk in the integrity uh, in his house and keep a clean conscience before God. Verse 2. I will give heed to the blameless way when without come to me. I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. And so a firm resolution on the part of David to give heed and to walk in the ways of God in his home life as well as his public life, in his home life. Brethren, we're not faithful to God in our home. We're not faithful. It doesn't make any difference how many times we assemble with the saints and we, we worship God in song and prayer together. If we're not home faithful to God in our home life as a husband, as a wife, as a son, as a daughter, as a parent, we're not faithful. David makes a resolve as we should to be faithful in his house to walk in integrity as well as in public. Verse 3, look at this. He says, I'll set no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. And then he says, it won't fasten its grip on me. Here's a resolve to keep his, his life morally pure. And that's absolutely essential to pleasing the Lord. Hebrew writer says, pursue a life of holiness. Pursue a life of holiness. We'll fail sometimes, but pursue it. 
Without it, we won't see the Lord. Sometimes in this sinful world, we can't avoid seeing vulgar things. We can't avoid seeing some immoral thing on the phone, on the television set, on the computer. It's just, there it is. It shows up. But what does David say about it in verse 2? He says, I will not set these kind of things before my eyes. That is, intentionally set these kind of things before my eyes. When, when the kids were smaller as they were growing up, I had that written out large verse on top of our television set, and there it sat day after day. I will set no and no evil thing before my eyes. I uh, should still have it there. That's a good, good goal for all of us to make. The old, an old saying, an old Proverbs is, you can't, maybe you can't keep that bird from landing on your head, but uh, you can sure keep him from building a nest there. You know, we, we, this is something we all need to be vigilant about, very careful about in our spiritual life, because there is a flood of immoral filth that floods this nation each and every day, every moment of every day, and it's getting worse. We need to be very alert in this area. Unless, as David warns, it'll get a grip on you. If you're not careful, it'll, it'll grab you. It'll fasten its grip on you. It'll be like a narcotic. I, I could tell you the stories of preachers and elders I have known in my 48 years of preaching who stood up and said things like this over and over again to an audience. Right, Eddie? And yet gave in to this particular sin. Gave in to pornography. Gave in to these immoral things. And eventually did intentionally put those things before their eyes. It got a, it got a hold of them. It grabbed them. Now, many of them came out of that. And they repented of that. I want you to remember the very person saying this gave in to it. David. And only by the grace of God did he get away from it and repented of it. God said he forgave you. If you've fallen into that, I know you didn't intend to. You didn't intend to. It was just there. And you looked and you kept looking. Brother, sister, today while this is fresh on your heart, I want you to please go to God in prayer having repented of your sins, confess that sin to him, get it out of your life, that rope will just grow bigger and bigger around you. It will bind you, it will imprison you. And ask another brother or sister for help. You didn't intend for this to happen, but it happened. And now you're involved in that. You want to get out of it. Ask another bro brother or sister to help you get out of it. And they will lovingly, mercifully pray with you, for you, and do all that they can to hold you accountable and help you get out of that immoral mess. It's a tidal wave of immoral mess that we're facing each and every day. We need to be on guard against it. Job said, I, will, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How could I gaze on a virgin? He understood the seriousness of it his own day. He's, he's basically saying, I've made a promise not to look with lust or passion on anyone other than my wife. And his primary motive for that is in verse 4, God sees my ways and he numbers my steps. Let's be very careful about these kind of things. And then finally, in verse 4, David says this. He says, a perverse heart shall depart from me. I will know no evil. The word perverse means twisted, distorted, calling evil good and good evil, which is pretty much where this country is right now. Well, nation, the nation of Israel got into that kind of thinking, and they were destroyed, 586 and 70 AD, because they're calling good evil and evil good. And David says, I'll not, not let my mind go there. I will not be caught up in anything except the word of God. The Bible rips the mask off of evil. The Bible identifies sin for what it really is, a, a, a terrible lie. All sin is a lie. It gives you false hope, and it gives you a terrible end if you stay in it. And so stay in the word of God and you'll avoid the perverse way. 
The remainder of what David has to say in this psalm, and I've used this psalm to encourage goal, spiritual goal setting on the part of each one of us, brethren, but the remainder of it pretty much has to do with David and his rule as the anointed king of Israel and how he's going to administer that rule. And it's, it's basically patterned after the administration of God and his rule of this world, his sovereignty over this world. And so the remainder of that has to do with his administration within this world. So brethren, what goals have we set? What is our resolve in seeking to know the Lord and his will for us? And are we praying about that? Brother and sister, we cannot teach what we don't know. We cannot share things we don't understand. And we cannot offer people what we don't have. And so with Bible study, prayer, growth. As, as Ben pointed out in his good lesson on Wednesday evening, always studying with the intention of doing what we're learning. The goal of our instruction is love from pure heart and clean conscience. Always studying with the intent of applying the things that we're learning. Set goals in, in that regard. And so I want to encourage as much as I possibly can in this lesson Spiritual goal setting, long range goals, certainly to be with the Lord forever, be a part of that resurrection, but short range goals in between to help us reach those long range goals. The greatest goal that could ever have been set was accomplished by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to seek and save that which was lost. That was me. I was lost in sin. That was me. Recently, we uh, studied Luke 15 in our class downstairs, and I asked Angel, Angel, I know you're listening to this downstairs, but I asked Brother Angel to read that passage to the class. And how that, that son who greatly mistreated his father wandered away in a life of sin, gave himself to every sinful thing you could imagine, and then came back to his father in repentance and humility, and the father welcomed him back, embraced him, and kissed him, and rejoiced at his return. And as Angel was reading that passage, Angel began to openly cry. And he said, that was me. That was me. And of course, I said, as we all would say, Angel, that was all of us. That's all of us. We all wandered into sin. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each has sought his own way. But the love of God is just incomprehensible. It is an undying love. I'll never understand it, but I'm sure thankful for it. God welcomes us back when we humble our hearts and turn to him. He welcomes us back. Through Jesus Christ, the greatest goal that could ever be set was accomplished, the forgiveness of our sins and eternal life with God forever. That is what he offers you right now. That is, that is something you could have. Will you be a part of Christ's goal of bringing many sons and many daughters to glory? As saints here are participating we're rejoicing in Jesus fulfilling that goal by accepting God's gift and committing our lives to him in love. Will you also be a part of, of that goal? And you can say as the Apostle Paul then, you know, whatever I've done, whatever I've been a part of, however I've messed up my life, forgetting what lies behind and pressing forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Won't you be a part of that goal? How can we help you do that? Let's stand and sing the song that's been prepared. <laughs>